there's another inside the atom right here. A journey into the past, all the way back to ancient Greece. One tablespoon of uranium is about the same as 750 tons of coal. One tablespoon. In the 1940s and 50s, the company General Electric, you can see right here, still got the same logo. Same logo. That's pretty cool. I always like that. Um, GE hired renowned comics artists, including George Inky Russo of Batman fame, to draw a series of books called The Adventures in Science. The series covered everything from space travel to electricity to the development of the atomic age and our scientific discoveries involving the nature of the atom. And what's interesting about these comics is that apparently in the 40s, 50s, the immediate post-war period of World War II, they actually thought that comics were having a negative effect, much the same way we all hear about people railing, ranting against video games nowadays, um, saying they have a negative effect on the youth. Lots of people thought comics were rotting our brains. Um, GE comes out and has an educational and a historical uh, scientific and historical educational series of comics trying to inspire the next generation of engineers. And so these are straight off the tales of, you know, at, right at the dawn of the atomic age and right as modern electronics or as the transistor was discovered. Um, these electronics are entering our homes and our daily lives, out of the labs and into mass production in the market with TVs. Um, you could see here, you know, refrigerators, the radio was big before TVs became big. And then 70s and 80s brought about the VHS, which was novel for the first time. You could watch videos, videos on demand at your house. So... The history, this is just a good example of what drew me to these books here, was the historical element, the way they track the history of the development of the scientific understandings that underpin the engineering of the technology, um, engineering and technology that we are surrounded with today. I just love putting it in the proper context of, you know, it's always... Uh, it's a trope now, but really it's it's powerful to remember how much, how new all this technology around us is. Um, especially on the, in the dawn of the, I don't know whether we call it the fourth internet revolution. And this is all relevant. Um, to put ourselves in the proper context of our modern developments, technological, scientific and uh, even geopolitical when it comes to the, uh, the atomic age there. That's actually how I, as a side note, that's how I found out about these comics. I was researching the Manhattan Project in particular, World War II also on like a wider scale, but um, for my video about the Demon Corps, which is coming out pretty soon, hopefully pretty shortly after this, uh, it led me into exploring reading about the broader Manhattan Project and World War II, and um, that's when I stumbled upon an article that had an excerpt. I don't think I have the comics unwrapped yet, but hiding in one of these packages here is an edition of the Adventures in Science series here called The... I think the power of the atom and I thought it was just maybe a historical little section of a more 
fic fiction based, you know, typical comic, superhero comic. But it turned out, you know, as I, I clicked the link, clicked enough links, I stumbled upon a PDF of the, the entire comic, and they were fictional, but they're historical fictional and educational. And they had a ton of not only, you know, great pictures, and of course the information, the delivery of the, the historical process of human exploration, specifically scientific exploration that allowed us to discover and experiment and probe and compare and um, incrementally and sometimes revolutionarily improve on our knowledge and get a deeper understanding of the world around us. And it's just ever deepening, ever widening. All the information we have available to us um, and the technologies, it, we're just surrounded with it. And our world is defined in a lot of ways by the technological age that we're in right now. So um, putting our current understanding in the proper context really helps us appreciate and have gratitude for just how how much energy and technological power we have at our disposal here in the West in particular, but increasingly everywhere around the world. Um, we're going to unbox these, un unpackage them, and we're going to find out what's, which one of these packages has the Age of the Atom comic in it, but um, I went online and these were incredibly cheap. Um, I couldn't believe they were, you know, all of them were under $10 and these came as a, a couple of them came in packages of, you know, three, four, five groups that, you know, shook out to be less than like $5 a piece. So, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's find out where our comic du jour is. And if you guys like this series, let me know, and we'll, um, you know, continue it, because I'd really love to have an excuse to read through all these. Hey, all right, scored big on our first try. So I have, I think, I got a couple duplicates, but um, it just worked out to where it's cheaper to buy some in the groups, so you know how that goes, right? And, um... And these are, I feel like at this point, they're so old. They're from, some are from the 40s from what I understand, but uh, a few of them are from the 50s and even 60s. But still, I mean, they're almost pieces of art, you know, genuine pieces of historical art at this point. So if anything, after I read them, maybe I'll, I'll post them, uh, put them behind, you know, put them, frame them, I guess put them on the wall. 
So this is the one that I first found, the one that first piqued my interest, that I stumbled upon in the article about the Manhattan Project, and um, then I discovered there's a whole series of them. I don't even think I got them all, but I have at least 10 or 12 of them. And... Um, It's little stories that are the comic book format generally, but um, they're narratives where an older guy kind of walks a younger guy and teaches him, mentors him, shows him different things about, uh, you know, different aspects of science or technology. And typically there's a big history element involved in it too. So we could see right here the Public Relations Department, Department 2-119, the General Electric Company in Schenectady, New York. I don't know if these have, yeah, 1948, there we go. I was looking for a date, and I found it. These are pieces of history, right? So, I, I'm really happy with these. I spent probably $100 on, I don't know, maybe I said 10 to 12, maybe I have like 15 total additions uh, between the duplicates and all that too. So, we'll see. We're going to put this aside and revisit this after we open up the rest. But um, after I read them, eventually, I think they're so, uh, you know, it, so easy to look at, so enjoyable. Such a, uh, I mean, they're cool pieces of art in themselves, but then the 1960s atomic age aesthetic that they have to them is also super appealing. So don't be surprised if you see them in the background of some of my, some of my future videos. All right. some legit packaging here. Put it inside cardboard. I have to be sure to give this guy an extra exceptional rating for the exceptional packaging. Nice. sticker, a little, little marketing sticker here. Here we go, guys. Shout out to Captain Freakout Psychedelic Radio Podcast. <laughs> uh, I have not ever heard of that, so if it turns out to be a little too psychedelic, don't blame me. That's cool, man. Um, yeah, anybody, I guess, who's watching this has probably already seen my two polls where we... You guys decided, uh, you guys voted to have the comic book reading be our next video, and this was the thumbnail for it. And, um, yeah. This is a legitimate comic book packaging right here. I recognize this from old Chicho's channel. I've never been big into comics in particular. I, you know, enjoy them, but uh, I just have the ones from my childhood. Um, but I'm realizing that, you know, tangible artifacts, anything that's not digital, 
is just going to increase in value, especially pieces of history like this. So I think if I were you guys, I've heard people invest in comics, not just because they enjoy them. You know, you can read them, handle them. But when you finish them, you put them on the shelf. If you package them correctly, you can accrue interest, you know. Think about that. I never realized you can invest in things other than real estate and gold. I never thought about that until not too long ago. So this, again, the historical aspect of it, the fact that this was written, see if it's before 1969. Yeah, 1965, right there. And just as I have to pause for a minute to let the jet fly overhead. Um, isn't it funny to think that a lot of this is probably speculating about what life's going to be like beyond the year 2000. And here we are in 2024, looking back at this, um, you know, a bit of history. And again, I love the educational aspect of it. It's not just pure historical fiction. They have science and mathematics, education behind it. Gravity is the force that pulls objects, like this ball, towards the center of the Earth. Fine, Johnny. Now how about a bike ride demonstrating to illustrate the next principle? Centrifugal force. <laughs> yeah, just so you guys know what you're into. And for later when we read the, uh, when we read the comic. I'll try my best to do, do my best 1950s scientist voice. Of course, and we gotta remember... As soon as World War, World, World War II ended, you had the Korean War, and then 20 years later you had the Vietnam War, um, and all throughout we had the major tension between the two great superpowers until China in the late 90s really emerged on the scene um, of the USSR, Russia, and the US. So... I'm really curious when we read these how much of Cold War propaganda is going to be in here too. Um, and being an adventure in science, science related, I'm also curious to see how little of it is going to be in here too. Curious to see how, you know, how much they stick to the science and away from the politics. But nonetheless, this is going to be really, uh, this is going to be fun. I think all these are really cool. This one's obviously space, space flight, space exploration is captures the imagination most grippingly, deeply. But the more you learn about the other aspects of science, the electricity, power, you know, the engineering behind jets and we um you know what, maybe I'll put this one back in the package for now. You come to appreciate just how, uh, how difficult it was for humans to actually get to the point of um, our technological know-how and understanding, our scientific understanding of the universe. And it just makes you it's like all aspects of life. You're stricken with illness. You appreciate life. You're stricken with um, family tragedies. You appreciate relationships. When you're hit by a major natural disaster, you appreciate beautiful, fair weather. It gives you a deeper sense of your you're in our place in, uh, in the world, in the universe, to learn more about more.
things. Human experience, scientific understanding, human experience, scientific experiments, histor historical events, and just um, how difficult it was to get to where we are today and how precious life is and how amazing the universe really is. Oh, some fine uh, engineering here. I like that. The painter's tape. Save a piece of cardboard. Looks like we got multiple additions here. Multiple installments in the series. Oh yeah, that's right. The tape has it's held down by two different sides, isn't it? Yeah, number two. Multiple uh, episodes within each series, within each topic segment, and uh, Sam, written by maybe Joseph. Samixon. Illustrated by maybe Jeffrey Russo's. I watched the Veritasium episode the other day about the blue LED. I, I'm sure at least some of you have watched it because it's... Um, it's, it's got a lot of views, and um, rightly so, because it, it was a really interesting exploration of the history of the LED. I didn't realize, I love how well he explains it, and then, of course, has the super instructive illustrations, animations, to go along with his explanations of the actual science and engineering behind it, of the different... At the atomic level, uh, the electrons interact um, in different lattices of different materials stacked on top of each other, running currents through it, and how they either obstruct the current up until a certain voltage is applied, and then they let the current flow, and how they're oriented so that current can only flow one way, being the, the meaning of the word diode, which is... That's what LED stands for, light emitting diode. So it's a diode in which current can only flow one direction and which is specifically engineered and constructed with specific materials that allow the, the electromagnetic stimulation of the materials through a certain applied voltage, usually only one or two one or two volts at a very low current, and um, as the, the electrons are stimulated, they, as they drop back down after being stimulated, they emit photons. And when you have millions and billions of photons happening, being emitted per second, it becomes perceptible to the human eye. And um, so we have... Yeah, number two, number three here. But Veritasium, yeah, he, he does a great job, number four. Breaking down science in the same way that I think these uh, break down the science. 
in the history, I guess, is what called Veritasium's episode, that LED episode to mine, was because he, um, he went into the history behind just how unlikely it was, or how difficult at least, number five and six, it was to, for this one Japanese engineer who worked day and night, took one day off a year, the Japanese New Year holiday, for like 18 straight months, worked 12 hours a day, went right home, went to sleep, got back up, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. in his lab. Came over to Gainesville, Florida, actually, not too far from me. Studied in the University of Florida's engineering department and um, learned some tricks. Went back to Japan, worked for a company in his own little lab, had some breakthroughs, but was ultimately stalled. And, um, yeah, finally discovered how to make the blue LED work. Because the blue is on the short end of the electromagnetic, the, the region of the electromagnetic spectrum that, uh, that we can see, we call invisible light. And because it's on the short end, it's on the high frequency, the high energy end. And so red being the lowest energy, visible light we can see, when it dips below that, goes into infrared. And then green is slightly higher, somewhere in the middle between blue and red, but the configurations of diodes, the, the engineering, the construct, the um, materials used, were, were able to easily produce red and green, which is why in the old, you know, this age here, when they first came out in the 50s and 60s, and the old panels of, you know, rocket ships and laboratories of that era, you only see red blinking lights, and then later on green, but you never see blue. And red, green, and blue being primary colors, you could fuse them so to make any color, but because blue hadn't been invented, it, uh, we were stuck not being able to use, I'm pretty sure this is probably LED light right here, a fusion of red, green, and blue together to produce white. And that's just how we visually our chemicals in our eyes interpret a dispersion of equal, roughly equal amounts of red, blue, green, and blue um, stimulating our optical nerves. We interpret that as white light. That's why even though the sun is technically peaks in the, I think, green or yellow portion of the spectrum, it still has enough output in the other colors to uh, merge into just what looks kind of white with a slightly yellow tint to us. But um, anyways, yeah, the, the story is fascinating behind the invention of the LED, the blue LED in particular. And... Um, and just think about the impact. It has much lower heat output, much lower energy use than a traditional filament and even a fluorescent light. And um, it's impacted. I, I believe it's, we wouldn't be able to have modern cell phone screens without it. So just think about that. Just every little invention, every little incremental invention or revolutionary invention especially was was not not taken for granted. It wasn't just dropped in our lap. Although, um, I definitely want to do an episode soon about the, the really wild, mystical side of scientific and technological breakthroughs that come about through dreams or daydreams, visions, just uh, kind of appearing. But in almost all those cases, the structure of the DNA is one, the benzene molecule is another, the, the structure of that. All those people had worked tirelessly for years, oftentimes, trying to, you know, work on one particular problem and then 
with all that latent knowledge and information whirling around in their brains, they're unconscious to some degree or to a large degree, finally just snaps it together into a a epiphany. So that's something worth talking about. In our last package here. another inside the atom right here. So, inside the atom. It's a power plant. And little, little Johnny's gonna get a, a tour through the power plant here.
is about the same as 750 tons of coal. One tablespoon. of the future.
go ahead and count these. seven number five and four let's let's put these in order here. number three number four then we got number five right there right there Let's see if we got number six too. 
six.
go spread them out one last time. 